a transformed mind renews our understanding to why presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice is a spiritual act of worship. Conforming to this world is no longer an option. It's no longer an option. It's not, you know, one day I, I will and one day I won't. I'm going to show you that this is practical and it's automatic if you just do as the word says. So as I was studying, I was wondering, I'm like, Lord, what kind of introduction can I give to a scripture passage like this? And he gave me about, he gave me an example of an instance in my life where something radically changed my life. 2004, men and women of vision. Ah, radically changed my mind, my, my whole life. This was an interpretive dance ministry of worship. These young people, they ranged from the ages of 19, late teens into the mid and early 20s. These young people loved God. I loved God. They loved to praise him, and I loved to praise him. And the experience changed my life from even there. This was our routine. We would hold practice in the basement of my home, and we would put on worship music, and as they came in one by one, they would take some personal time of reflection with God, just them alone. I don't even know if cell phones was really popular then, but we didn't have any of that. They, one by one, they would spend time with God. And then as everybody came together, we would pray, and then we would have a Bible study because the Bible study would keep them focused on who they were dancing for and why they were dancing. And when they would prepare their bodies, even in that, they would prepare their bodies and stretch their bodies and, and just absorb the worship music that they were stretching to. And I believe it changed their lives because I know that it changed my life. It took me from a place of praise to a higher level of worship. Because when you do that often, and you do that week by week by week, it makes a change in you. And everything about you changes. You become more aware of how you live your life for Jesus. You become more aware of the things that are not pleasing to him, and you have the power to change it because God gives you the power to change it. If you say that you believe in Christ, then belonging to him, belonging to him makes us behave differently. It makes us behave differently. And a change will come. A change is going to come. Now we're in the book of Romans, and the scripture text was, was read. Um, Paul did not start this church. Pastor Karen, she had us in the book of Romans, and I'm kind of slingshotting around from the three and four, or, or, the, or the three through eight, four through eight that she read, and I'm going to do the one and the two. And it's important that you know this so that you can properly apply that. Amen. So Paul, he did not start the church. But he was appointed by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which means he had the authority, not by man, but the authority by God to show them and teach them the foundations of the faith. But he didn't start this church. There were some, some uh, Roman Jews at Pentecost that experienced the Holy Spirit and they went back to Rome and they took this experience with them and now they knew that God was not only for the Jew but he was for everyone and so he they welcomed them into their faith and into their fellowship well there was a little issue there doesn't sound like it would be but it was you see these Gentiles they came as they were just like me and you we come as we are 
They came as they were, but the problem was that they lived in a polytheistic environment and society. They worshiped more than one God, and it came natural for them. It's just something that was part of them. And so they received Jesus, but however, they received Jesus along with. That's a problem. And, 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 and the Jews that came back who had the experience, they were still adhering to the law. And so they felt that these Gentiles that they welcomed into their faith, that they had to be circumcised in order for Jesus to accept them. That's a problem. So that's why Paul is writing this letter, because the church was divided. Paul writes in, in Romans, uh, in, in the chapter 1, 1 and 11, he says, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. They were weak because they were divided. Amen? And so that spiritual gift that Paul wanted to bring to them was the knowledge of the faith so that he could get them back on the right track. Amen. But something had happened there. Something had happened. Uh, uh, Claudius, who was also, he was the emperor, and he was also deemed to be worshipped as a god. He was annoyed because of all the friction from the Jews and from the Christians, and he wanted them out. He wanted those Jews out, and he expelled them. But along with that went the knowledge and the foundation that the Gentiles needed to grow as a strong church. When they came back in five years after Claudius had died, they found the church was, in, was more devastated than ever. Not only did they not want to abide by the law, they were idolaters in the church of God. So that was a problem. And this is how Paul, he approaches the correction of this church. First of all, he addresses that God is sovereign. God is one. God is holy. God is the creator of all things. All things are created for him and by him. He teaches them that man has fallen, has fallen from grace. And he, he says that all of us, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody, Jew and Gentile, everybody has fallen short of the, of the glory of God. So God's wrath against the ungodly and against the sinner is just and it's righteous. The wages of sin is death. God had mercy, we're talking about God's mercy, on fallen mankind. See, God's mercy, he loved the world so much, at the center of his mercy was his love and his compassion. Amen. God's mercy is God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us. And all who sinned and fall short of the glory of God was saved only through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. We're justified through Jesus and we're saved from God's wrath through him and only him. Salvation is for everyone. This is what Paul is, is spelling out to them. He wants them to know about these mercies. And it's important because when we go down... To our scripture text, it says, therefore, we're saved by grace. There's nothing that we can do. We're saved by grace, not works. And salvation has come to the Gentiles, who all that who would believe, forgiveness comes through the atoning blood of Christ. And we're freed from the grasp of sin because the Holy Spirit now comes within us and empowers us to live right. So in view of God's mercy, this is the behavior that we should have. Paul makes a shift now. And he goes from the foundational teachings to the practical application. This is spiritual, but it's also practical. Don't get so spiritual that you don't think God's word is practical. It's, it was written for me, and it was written for you. So the scripture text starts off like this. It says, therefore I urge I urge you, I implore you, I beseech you, brethren. Ah, he's begging them. He wants to get their attention. He says, by, in view 
of God's mercy, in view of what he's done for us, in view that he died for us, in view that he shed his blood on the cross for us because we couldn't do it, only God can do it. So in view of God's mercies, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So God, he fixes the dilemma that we find ourselves in. God did it. It's his tender mercy. From his tender mercy, he did it. Oh, he had mercy on us. So in view of that, we have reverence for him. We have reverence for him and we honor him with sacrifice. So he says, in view of God's mercies, offer, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. As living sacrifices. Why does he say as living sacrifices? Jesus died for us. And so when we come to the altar of Jesus to be covered by his blood, we offer our lives. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice. But in sacrifice, we know also that something has to die. And what dies? Our sin nature. Jesus died. He took the penalty. He took all the sin. For now and forever, he died. He died. So we come living, giving him a sacrificial life. Amen. Amen. He died. So he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When we come to the altar of God, we come in worship. And what do we find there? We find the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is life. And we're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And we're cleansed. And through the blood of Jesus, we're atoned for. Through the blood of Jesus, we're justified. We're not guilty. God looks upon us as a new creation in him. Hallelujah. And so when we present, we come to God and we present our lives, then it's him that makes us it's Jesus' blood that makes us holy and pleasing. Ah, it's a spiritual act of worship. And so that's what we do. That's what we do. Day, we bear our cross daily, huh? We bear our cross daily. It's a spiritual act of worship. Let's um, summarize down. So our, our sacrifice is a spiritual act of worship. And we're turning from our sin, nature, to be covered by the blood of Jesus. And we're intentional in honoring him by sacrificing our whole being. Not just our body, but our mind. Not just our mind, but our spirit. Our whole being. Because if we present ourselves holy to God, then he makes us holy and pleasing unto him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So we honor him. And we praise him. Oh, Jesus, a change is going to come. Worship is a spiritual act of intimacy. A spiritual act of uh, 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 intimacy. Jesus prays in the book of John. He, he prays for all the believers. And he says, just like, Father, that I am in you and and." I and I'm paraphrasing, I am in them and they are in me. We are one. We're one in him. We're one in Christ Jesus. We're one with God. It's a sacrificial life that we live. It's a sacrificial life. And so the word in Greek for intimacy is to know. We have to know him. So there's this bumper sticker that I used to have on my car. And I didn't really like bumper stickers that much because I thought that they made cars look all messy. I remember back in the day, and I'm going to date myself. Y'all going to know how old I am here in a minute. But they would have these Volkswagen buses, and they would have these, these, 
They would have these bumper stickers everywhere. They were on the windows, on the bumpers, on the front window, back window. You couldn't even see in. And I thought that looked so ugly and so trashy. <laughs> now they don't have the bumper stickers no more. They just tint the windows. That's, that's better, but you still can't see in. <laughs> but anyway, this bumper sticker that I had had no Jesus, no peace. And then at the bottom, it also said, no Jesus, no peace. And I'm like, wow, that, that really caught hold of me, huh? No Jesus, K-N-O-W, intimacy. If you know Jesus, then you will intimately know his peace. Huh? But then at the bottom where it said, no, Jesus, it was N-O. No, Jesus, no peace. If you don't know Jesus and there's no Jesus in your life, you will have no peace. If you're living your life and you say that you know Jesus, but you're living it like there's no Jesus in your life, there's no way you can know intimately his peace. No Jesus, no peace. And so Paul was telling them, he went on in, in verse 2. He said, if you want to know Jesus and you want to know his peace, and now that you have submitted yourself and presented yourself as a living sacrifice and Jesus has made you holy and pleasing to God, he said, then don't conform to this world any longer. Not to the pattern of this world any longer. So in the Greek, the definition for the word conform it's the pattern or to fashion yourself after something. In this case, it's patterning yourself after the world. Now, the world is ever changing. The world, never it's, it's always changing. And in that change, it gets further and further and further away from God. So now, if you look at where you are over here, you're all cleaned up. The blood of Jesus has cleaned you up. There's, your mind is on him. You're, you're not conforming to the pattern of that anymore on what's behind you. He says, so don't allow the world to influence you. Don't allow the world to make the change in you. You have to keep your minds on Christ. So he says, but, he says, don't conform to this world any longer, but, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I said, oh, I like this, Jesus. I like this. I, I, well, I was looking up words. I looked up transform self. I looked it up, and I found that transform and transfigure was the same Greek word. Oh, and I'm like, ooh, this is good because it took my mind to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, I got it right this time, and John, huh? They went up on the mountain with Jesus, and Jesus went off to pray. And as he prayed, his body transfigured. It shone with a divine light. And I put that application together and said, transfigure, okay, transform. That means our thinking is going to go from darkness to light. It's going to trans up to a higher level. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Illuminate your minds. Ah, so your thinking changes. My point Again, is when we're intentional about our sacrifice as a spiritual act of worship, we will conform to the likeness of Christ. So now we're not conforming to the world any longer, and we've changed our thinking. Now it's time to conform again, but this time it's to the likeness of Christ because of where our mind is. It's practical. You think about it, it's practical. It's spiritual, but it's practical. And a change will come. A change will come. We're changing to the likeness of Christ. 
And in transforming, we allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds, and it gives us a different perspective. It gives us a different perspective about life. Amen. Amen. So we're more conscious and aware of the things in this world that aren't pleasing to God. Individually and socially. With renewed minds, it's easier for us to make the necessary adjustments that we need to make because we want to please him. Because we love him. It's a spiritual act of worship. You bring your life to him. He sprinkles you with his blood and he cleanses you. And we thank him and we adore him and we extol him because of his tender mercies. It's a spiritual act of worship. As a result of transformed thinking, we find that now we're conforming to Christ. Point. Then... The scripture too says B. Then and only then, after you've done all these things, he says, then you will be able, you will have the ability to test and approve, to discern, to be able to tell the right from the wrong, to be able to tell what's pleasing and what's not pleasing, to be able to tell what you should change and what is good. So our change becomes more about God. It becomes more about him and not about us. Because it's a spiritual act of worship. If you're trying to do it in your flesh, that's why you're missing it. It's a spiritual act of worship. And it's practical. And a change will come. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand the will of God. And with the Holy Spirit, we're able to test and to approve and discern what's pleasing to God. Our senses are heightened, and we're more aware of what's acceptable to his will. So God is, he's providing all of this for us. And all he's asking for is a sacrificial life. Bring yourself as a living sacrifice and let me clean you up and show you what I want you to do. If you are trying to do it by yourself, I'm going to tell you what, take Jesus' hand. Amen. So if there's some people that say, well, you know, I've tried that. I've tried that and, and I really don't see a change. I still find myself going through this and I still find myself going through that. And I, I'm just wrestling. And I'm here to tell you that change has already begun. Because if you're wrestling, that's indicative to the fact that change has already begun in your life. Because if it hadn't, there would be no reason for you to be wrestling. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let go of what you're holding on to and let the Holy Spirit guide you through it. It's practical if you believe what God has said. You say, we say we believe him. Well, if we believe in him, belonging to him makes us behave differently. Just ask Jacob. Jacob wrestled. He wrestled with God. He wrestled all night long. He said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But by the time he let him go, Jacob walked with a limp. Oh, but he was limping toward God. Everything that you heard about Jacob from then on was God, God, God. God, stop wrestling with him. You can't fight with God. Your arms aren't long enough and you aren't strong enough. Let go and let God. And a change will come. A change will come. I'm here to share with you right now tonight that just by default, we're all sinners. Every single one of us. And we need a Savior. And if you haven't claimed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me share this with you. You're appointed to the wrath of God. 
And that's just the truth. And so today would be a good time and a good opportunity for you to give your life to him if you have not. Because it's only through his blood can you be saved. Only through believing of, in him that you can be saved. It's only Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And no man gets to the Father except by him. And if you're living your life and you say that you know Jesus and you're living it like there's no Jesus, then I admonish you, I urge you, I beg you to come and let the ministers minister to you. Come on, worship team, I'm finished. Let the ministers minister to you and impart a spiritual gift, knowledge into you that will make you strong. God bless you.